Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to Ask a VC, where we put VCs in the hot seat. This week, we have Anne Mirako, co-founder of Floodgate Investments. Thank you so much for joining us, Anne. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to go into your background. Um, you uh, are at Floodgate with fellow partner Mike Maples, and you focus on investments in e-commerce, security, and big data. Uh, you currently sit on the boards of Mod Cloth, Refinery29, Chloe and Isabel Juanilo, um, Lyft, Iasti, um, and, and many more. Um, and you were also previously a board member at TaskRabbit, which was one of your first investments mm -hmm. at Floodgate. Um, so I'm, this is a pretty diverse group of investments. And uh, one thing that I was reading about you as I was prepping for this was that you said um, the biggest investment opportunities for venture capital in 2013 would be radical science, mobile commerce, and mobile enterprise. And you had said that um, in January, and we're sort of more than halfway through the year. Do you still feel like those are the big opportunities for 2013? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you look at the themes around my investments, um, I still believe that there's a lot of room in terms of what, what we're looking at. And so one big theme in terms of commerce for me has been this notion of lean back commerce. Um, which Mod Cloth embodies, Refinery29 embodies, and certainly Winilo does. It's sort of transactive content where you have people being brought in, um, being entertained, and then without even thinking about it, might, they might be buying things. Uh, so on, on that front, I think there's a lot of room to grow. Uh, mobile in general, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, I feel that uh, just the fact that a lot of these people have handsets and um, you know, businesses that went from offline to online were not as successful as online first. You're going to have the same transitioning happening from online to mobile, and then companies who are still mobile first will, will perhaps have a more compelling experience. So that lean back experience that you're, you're saying, I mean, that has a lot to do with mobile too, right? Because, you know, I'm at home on my iPad in the evening, and totally. I'm like flipping through Juanilo trying to figure out, you know, what... Uh, you know, what some of my friends or what are some of the people that I know or what's trending in fashion at the moment and Juanilo is a great place to kind of find that. Right. Is that, I mean, those are very much intertwined. I think so. And so in, in terms of that kind of content, which feels really relevant to you and highly personalized, or um, a host-based model, um, as in Refinery29, where you're looking at particular editors who you really trust, and the content that they create is really interesting to you. That's what leads to commerce, much more than sort of putting something in front of you and saying, this is what you should be buying. And so um, I think that kind of highly personalized, community-driven type of commerce is going to become increasingly important with mobile. I want to talk about that radical science element yeah. because I think that's like super interesting. I mean, you're definitely seeing more and more um, just ideas that are being funded that mm -hmm. seem out of the box that are crazy, but yet like they're starting to get more mass appeal in like drones, for example. Yeah. Like who would have thought, you know, we would be investing in drones right mm -hmm. now or you know, the sort of buzzword of the moment is Bitcoin. But what, where do you sort of fall into that? And what are some of the, the kind of radical science companies that you're pretty excited about right now? Yeah, so the reason why I got involved in radical science is twofold. Number one, my background, I have a PhD in math modeling and computer security. And so my, my reach is into both the technical insight and understanding what that technical insight is, I think is pretty good. Um, on the other side, I also have a great set of contacts with grad students and professors that I think is unique to me. Um, I also teach at Stanford in the engineering school, which I think also is a competitive advantage in finding the best sort of technical insights I want to invest in. I also think that, uh, at least at Stanford, it used to be that we had this guy, Rajiv Matwani, mm -hmm. who um, is sort of a legendary character in uh, startups, and particularly startups led by technical insight. And he was most well known for his uh, support of the Google founders. Um, he unfortunately recently passed away a few years ago, leaving a really big hole in terms of how do you shepherd these PhD students through the process of finding you know, that, what that business is or what that product is. And so um, having observed that firsthand as a PhD student, 
uh, that's something that I'm seeking to try to bridge that gap of, I have four papers um, that describe something that's really interesting. How do I turn that into a product? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the first companies that I found in this space came out of the math department at Stanford, and it was a which a, isn't it too? It's a good department to come out of when you're right. in, you know trying to find technical talent. Right, and so he, this guy Gurjeet Singh, um, sent me four math papers that had some insight around big data. And as a result of that, we ended up working together to try to figure out how to turn that into a product. He, I mean, he was courageous in trying to find great customers around this idea. Um, I kept on trying to get him to take an investment from me, and nine months later, he finally broke down and allowed me to invest in his seed round. I led that seed round, and in that process, really discovered what it takes to go from that technical insight into a product and into a company. And since then, that's become a real passion point for me. I think some of the most important innovations that happen in Silicon Valley come from those types of people, whether it's Google or VMware. And well, that's a good actually lead into yeah. one of our reader questions, which is, you know, you have been teaching at Stanford for some time. Have you ever invested in any of your students' ideas or, you know, Stanford students' ideas? Which is yes, because, you know, you just said you did. Yeah, so, Gurjeet wasn't yeah. an actual student of mine, um, but I've seen a lot of companies come out of our, mm -hmm. our classes. Um, I haven't actually invested directly in one of my students so far. Um, and I think that's actually, you know, both a good thing and potentially a bad thing. But it, what it what it reflects is that my teaching isn't some sort of effort to get deal flow, right? I uh, and this again is going back to what Rajiv Matwani used to do: is he taught for the love of teaching, and through that, some people were inspired to create companies, or they heard about these ideas that led to being great mm -hmm. companies. Um, I think that's what's most important, is to create incredible opportunities for highly technical people to be inspired to create companies, and that's what I want to do. That's great. Well, um, on to our next reader question. Um, what's the best way to make an introduction or try to introduce yourself to a VC that you don't know? We get this question all the time. Yeah. I think, you know, it's... Uh, it's we we take for granted out in Silicon Valley that you know we have access to people like you, but mm -hmm. you know it's really hard and intimidating for people to just cold call. What 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 would you say is your advice on that? I think the most important thing is to focus on your business, right? And once your business has either the characteristics of being something that could potentially be one of the most outstanding, you know, top fifteen companies of any given year. Um, that's sort of where you want to approach a VC. And uh, it doesn't even matter if you're getting a warm intro or a cold intro into a company. Um, it really matters who you are as a company and what, what your idea is and, and what you've proven so far in terms of your hypotheses. If you've done that legwork, then, then you can always approach a VC and say, here's sort of what I've learned in the process of building my business, and this is the, the current traction that I have. And could you either help me, give me advice, what do you think? I think that's the best way. And, uh, and again, it doesn't matter which entry point you have, um, as long as you're able to have those proof points. Have you made any investments in some any entrepreneurs who have cold called you? So in my earlier career at Charles River Ventures a long time ago, actually, the only investment that was made um, that where I found, I found the deal um, was a company that actually cold emailed into Charles River Ventures. And so there's definitely track record of that happening. I mean, and there must be massive amounts of cold email that comes in. Sure. So, you know, sifting through that is probably a, a, a job, job in itself. Right, and, and it's sort of how do you stand out? So we get, you know, somewhere around 150 cold emails every week. And so if it's just a description of an idea, it's really hard for us to to delve into that, whereas if it's sort of, you know, these are the customers that, that I have and that I've bootstrapped to get to this point, that's suddenly very interesting because you've proven out that you have the characteristics of a true entrepreneur. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Anne, and thank you so much. Thank you.